In this video lecture, we're going to look, look at hearing and look at the structures of the ear and identify the structures associated with hearing and with balance. Um, but we'll concentrate just on the hearing and the transduction of sound waves along the ear and then how those sound waves are converted to electrical impulses. In another video, we'll cover the physiology of the balance. So looking at the ear anatomy, the ear is divided into three portions, the external, middle, and inner ear. The external ear consists of the auricle or pinna, that's the outer portion of the ear, that's designed to help um, draw in or bring in sound waves to travel up the next portion of the ear called the external acoustic meatus, but is also known as the auditory canal or ear canal. The ear canal is lined with hairs and ceruminous glands that secrete cerumen, which is basically earwax. And that's a pr protective substance so that any debris gets caught up in the earwax or even insects, God forbid, get caught up in there. And then the earwax dries up and will um, just fall out of the ear. The last portion of the ear is called the tympanic membrane or eardrum and it's cone-shaped and picks up the vibrations from the sound waves that travel through the eardrum. Now some um, sources will indicate that the tympanic membrane is actually part of the middle ear, but your book chooses to make it part of the outer ear. The middle ear is air-filled. It um, contains the auditory ossicles or bones. These are the malleus, incus, and stapes, or hammer, anvil, and stirrup. The, these are the smallest bones of the body. The stirrup is um, connected to the oval window, and then another structure associated with the middle ear is the round window, and we'll get, come back to their functions in a little bit. The pharyngotympanic tube is the fancy way of saying auditory tube or eustachian tube, but the name makes sense because the eustachian tube links the middle ear, or they'll say the tympanic portion of the ear, to the pharynx, or the pharyngo portion of the, of the term. So pharyngotympanic really is a good name, connecting the pharynx to the tympanic area of the ear. The idea of the eustachian tube is to equalize pressure on each side of the tympanic membrane so for example, when you go fly in a plane and the air pressure drops, the air pressure is going to drop in the outer ear, in the ear canal itself, but we need to have the eustachian tube open up to allow air to move out so that we can equalize the pressure in the middle ear. So that's why you're going to yawn or um, chew something like gum or move your jaw back and forth and hear the popping noise. That's simply to equalize the pressures on both sides so that these, the tympanic membrane can vibrate appropriately when it's hit with sound waves. There are two muscles associated with the middle ear. These are shown in this diagram below. I don't want you to worry about the names of those muscles, but I do want you to know their function. In order to protect the inner ear from damage from loud sounds that would cause excessive vibrations in that inner ear, um, we need to quiet or, or subdue those ossicles in the middle ear. So in response to a loud sound, we reflexively contract those two muscles associated with the middle ear. Notice that they're connected to the ossicles and therefore limit their movement. And if that limits the movement, then they aren't going to vibrate as much and cause as much vibrations in the middle ear, or excuse me, in the inner ear, and therefore protect that inner ear from damage. One of the disorders of the middle ear is called otitis media or middle ear infection. This is when you see fluids building up in the middle ear and pushing on the eardrum often those fluids um, become infected with either bacteria or virus and can cause a great deal of pain. It's more commonly seen in infants than adults because the infant's eustachian tube is more horizontal, whereas an adult's eustachian tube is vertical. The vertical nature of an adult tube allows fluids that may try to accumulate in that middle ear to drain out through the eustachian tube. 
an infant with such a flat stachian tube doesn't have the advantages allowing those fluids to drain, so therefore they're more susceptible to getting middle ear infections. To treat the middle ear infection, of course, we need antibiotics. Antibiotics are good for the bacteria, not so good for the viruses, or it doesn't work well for against, it doesn't work at all against viruses. Um, but often, most often, it's prescribed for any type of ear infection because it's impossible for the doctors to really be able to determine whether it's viral or bacterial. If a kid has excessive numbers of um, middle ear infections, the doctor may suggest having ear tubes put in. The ear tube is simply this little piece of plastic that's inserted in the eardrum and creates a hole in the eardrum so that fluids can drain out. Now, the, these ear tubes will fall out after a while. My son had those put in when he was about nine months old, and it was about, oh, I think three months later, unfortunately, one of them fell out, and maybe another six months after that for the other one before it fell out. The internal anatomy is a little bit more tricky. Um, the internal ear is buried inside of bone. So think of the skull, a section of the skull that has basically carved out a cave to hold the internal ear. Well, that cave that's carved out by the bone is called the bony labyrinth. And I literally think of it as a cave. Um, the, and it, well, it's illustrated in this diagram in light blue. This cave or cavity consists of, of three different areas. This portion of the cave is called the cochlea, kind of looks like a snail. The middle portion here is called the vestibule. And then this area here consists of three semicircular canals. And again, think of this as a cave. But instead of the cave being filled with air, the cave is filled with perilymph. Now living inside of our cave, is a very bizarre looking snake. And that snake then is the membranous labyrinth. And it consists of lots of different sacs and ducts. This portion of our snake here in the middle is the utricle and saccule. It's part of, the, or it's housed in the vestibule part of our cave. This portion here is the cochlear duct that's found inside the cochlea portion of our cave or bony labyrinth. And then we have semicircular ducts inside the semicircular canals. Now the membranous labyrinth, our, our snake itself, is filled with endolymph. Here's another picture of the cochlea to give you an idea of what's going on. Here's again the entire area here in that kind of brownish gray is the cochlea itself, our cave. Notice there's the bone around it. And then in, coiled inside of it is our membranous labyrinth snake or the cochlear duct. And you can see here how here's our snake, our cochlear duct, winding its way through all of the turns of the cochlea. If we cut the cochlea in half, we'd see this. So the cochlea is the entire area at the top portion and the bottom portion in blue, that would be the perilymph filled portions. The purple here is the cochlear duct. And the fluids inside the perilymph will move following these red lines going up to the tip of our little snail and then going on down again to the out this way. Okay. If we chop the cochlea in half, or, or take a slice out of it actually, you can see the cochlea consists of three chambers or scala. First is the scala vestibuli, the top portion here, filled with perilymph. Below it is the scala media, which is the cochlear duct. It's filled with endolymph and has some other structures associated with it. First of all, we've got the bottom, the basilar membrane, and then above that in the green is the organ accordi or spiral organ. And then above that is the tectorial membrane. 
And then finally below that is the Scala Timpani and it contains perilymph. Now sound waves are actually alterations in pressure. If I hit a tuning fork it makes that tuning fork vibrate back and forth. Every time it vibrates one direction it's going to compress the air on that side and then it vibrates away it causes the air pressure to lower in that spot or it's called rarefractions. So you can see sound waves are actually composed of alternating compressions and refractions or high and low pressures and we illustrate those sound waves as we, or those the alterations as sound waves. So the peak of our sound wave is where we have a compression. The bottom of the sound wave is where we have the refractions. We can characterize sound waves in two ways. One is by frequency. That's the number of waves that pass a given point at, in a given amount of time. So if we have really long wavelengths, we're going to have a low frequency. But if we have a really high or a short wavelength, we'd have a really high frequency. The, these are measured in hertz, and the humans can hear somewhere between 20 and 20,000 hertz. Typical or most sensitive sounds uh, we can hear are between 1,500 and 4,000 hertz. But the idea of frequency gives us the pitch. The higher the frequency, the higher the pitch, or the lower the frequency, the lower the pitch. Now, most sounds are not just one single frequency, but are actually a mixture of several frequencies together. Amplitude is the other way we can characterize sound. Amplitude is the height of the sound wave and gives us the sound intensity or how loud it is. This is measured in decibels and the range goes from 0 to 120 decibels. Zero is, would be the lowest sound that we could hear, or the quietest sound we could hear, whereas 120 decibels is actually causes pain when, when heard. Normal speech is about 50 uh, decibels. A rock concert can be as high as 120 decibels. Um, prolonged exposure to higher than 90 decibels can actually cause damage to the inner ear. So what we have to do then is transmit those sound waves all the way to the organ of Corti where we're going to again convert it into electrical impulses. So to get the sound waves back there, the sound waves are going to travel through the external auditory canal where they cause, those sound waves cause, the eardrum or tympanic membrane to vibrate. The vibration of the tympanic membrane then is transmitted to the ossicles and from the ossicles it's transmitted to the oval window so now that the oval window is vibrating. The oval window sets up wave-like actions to pass through the scale of vestibuli. Remember it's the part filled with perilymph and depending on the frequency of this sound it'll get a part of the organ accordi involved or, or and particularly the um, basilar membrane below the organ of Corti to vibrate. And then the sound waves or the wave actions of the perilymph will be transmitted from the scala vestibuli to the scala tympani and from there the scala tympani will cause the round window to vibrate back and forth. Now the purpose of the round window is basically to counteract the movement of the oval window so that pressures inside the perilymph remain constant. So in other words, as that stapes pushes the oval window in, the round window will move out. And as the stapes pulls the round window, excuse me, the oval window out, the round window moves in. So it counterbalances with whatever the oval window is doing. That way, if the again, if you push in at the oval window and the round window goes out, we don't change volumes in the perilymph and so there's no buildup of pressure that could interfere with our ability to hear the sound. To distinguish between different frequencies of sound waves, we need to understand what's the concept of resonance. Now resonance is the speed at which an object will vibrate if it's bumped. 
So for example, a wine glass. If you um, tap the edge of a wine glass, the glass will ring at a particular pitch or frequency. That's its resonance. And if an opera singer can match that resonance, she can cause the glass to vibrate and shatter. So different parts of the basilar membrane have different resonance. The cochlea here in this diagram has been stretched out. So you see basically think of the part of this the base, basilar membrane stretched out. And so the basilar membrane has different kinds of fibers in different regions of its length along the cochlea. Close to the oval window, you have short and stiff fibers, and these become longer and floppier the farther out you go in the cochlea until the distal end of the cochlea, the basilar membrane fibers are longer and floppier. So a particular fiber will vibrate at a particular wavelength based on how stiff and short it is or, or floppy and long it is. So a sound wave with a high frequency causes the basilar membrane um, close to the oval window to vibrate and a sound wave with a low frequency will cause the basilar membrane at the tip of the cochlea to vibrate. So different wavelengths of sound or different frequencies of sound causing different sections of the basilar membrane to vibrate. So there's different resonances along that basilar membrane. Now we have to convert the vibrating basilar membrane into action potentials. And so we do this using the spiral organ or the organ accordion. And let's look at the structure of the organ accordi first. Here's the basilar membrane down here. The organ accordi consists of these hair cells, and these hair cells have little hair bundles at the ends of it. The hair bundles are extend into this tectorial membrane. And the tectorial membrane is basically a kind of a gel-like substance. Think of it as jello sitting up there. And then we have these afferent fibers of the cochlear nerve running or connected to or synapsing to the hair cells. Okay, so that's the basic structure. So you have to imagine waves of the basilar membrane moving the hair cells. So as the basilar membrane vibrates, it causes those hair cells to vibrate and the hair bundles to vibrate or move back and forth into that tectorial membrane. Now the endolymph in the organ accordi is very richly concentrated or has a high amount of potassium. So when these hair cells or the hair bundles vibrate back and forth in this in and out of the tectorial membrane, it results in opening up of potassium channels. And since potassium is highly concentrated out here, that means potassium is going to diffuse in. As potassium diffuses in, remember potassium is positively charged, so as potassium moves in, it makes the inside more positive, and therefore you get depolarization. Now this is a graded depolarization, or a graded potential, it's localized to that area, but it's enough to cause the neurotransmitter transmitter, um, glutamate to be released in the synapse here between the hair cells and these afferent fibers. That glutamate then causes a graded potential to occur in those afferent um, fibers, which then is converted into action potentials that dra travel down the cochlear nerve and become part of the vestibular cochlear nerve. And then that travels to our brain, auditory centers of the brain, and we hear. Now, how does the brain distinguish pitch and loudness? As I said, sound has many frequencies. So how do we perceive pitch? Well, here it has to do with the number of hair cells that are vibrating in response to the basilar membrane vibrating at those different frequencies.
So for example, in E, here we have the cochlea stretched out. In E, you get these hair cells that are sensitive to the different frequencies of sound that make up the sound E. And so those hair cells end up sending action potentials in those afferent fibers, and those go to the back of the brain. And your brain interprets that combination of hair cells as E. Whereas you can see ah has a different combination of hair cells that are sensitive to those frequencies. So you get a different combination of action potentials along those fibers going to the back of your brain, and your brain receiving those combinations says ah. Or ooh has another set of just a smaller number of hair cells with a different numbers of action potentials coming from there, and your brain interprets that combination as ooh. Loudness is determined through the larger movements that are caused by the loud noise um, along that conduction pathway and finally to the basilar membrane. So the basilar membrane on quiet noises down here has only these, these hair cells are triggered, but it's the basilar membrane isn't moving that much, and so you have a low number of action potentials coming from those hair cells. But a loud noise gets the basilar membrane to vibrate a lot more. That causes larger graded potentials, more neurotransmitter released into those afferent fibers, causing more action potentials along the afferent fiber. And so therefore you get, or your brain interprets that as a louder noise. Deafness is one of the homeostatic imbalances, of course, we get with hearing. There are two types of deafness, either conduction or sensory neural deafness. Conduction deafness is something hampers the sound from getting, or the sound waves from getting from the outer ear to the inner ear. So there's some mechanical problem with the transmission of those sound waves. It could be a ruptured eardrum, so the eardrum can't vibrate, which means then the ossicles can't, and it can't continue on into the inner ear. Or maybe the ossicles are fused together so that even if the tympanic membrane is vibrating, it's not transmitting those vibrations to the ear middle, or to those ossicles because they can't vibrate. And therefore the inner ear won't vibrate. Sensory neural deafness, is damage to neural structures of the inner ear, particularly the cochlear hair cells, all the way to the auditory cortical cells um, within the auditory cortex. Um, one example would be damage to hair cells from a rock concert. If you're listening to a rock concert at 120 decibels, that's gonna be translated into a basilar membrane bouncing like crazy. Uh, remember, the bigger the loud or the louder the noise, the more the basilar membrane vibrates or the bigger vibrations there are. That means those hair cells are moving in and out of that tectorial membrane um, quite hard, and that can end up causing damage to the hair cells. And there's actually a famous musician who has the, obviously a rock, part of a rock band, um, that lost his quite a bit of his hearing because of overexposure to such high noises during his own rock concerts. And so we'll see if you can find out who that is or if you know who that is, and we'll talk about it in class. Tinnitus is ringing or clicking sounds in the ear. This can be the first symptom of cochlear nerve damage, but now when you get ringing in the ear, don't start freaking, you're starting to lose your hearing. It can also just mean some kind of temporary disruption in um, the inner ear that causes the ringing. And it can also be due to a side effect of some medications can lead to the ink, uh, ringing or clicking in your ears. So that ends our video lecture on hearing. As I said at the beginning, the next video lecture will look at equilibrium, which is also a function of the ear.